On this episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity, we're continuing with this theme of what it is to be partakers of the Holy Spirit. That name for God's people is found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. And I felt the best way to explore the depth of that particular calling is to examine the names given to the Holy Spirit because each one of those names indicates a different aspect of what we are partaking of in this particular calling. I enjoyed last week's session because we explored what it is to have him as our helper. He is the parakletos. He is our helper. He's the one who comes and stands by us to uphold us, to defend us. And this week, some names for the Holy Spirit that we're going to be focused on are just absolutely awesome. Let's start with Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, in that particular passage, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of life. I think it's important to see right from the beginning that the word translated life is zoe, which means divine life, God life, resurrection life. There's another word that is used for human life or natural life. For instance, Jesus said, Take no thought for your life, what you shall put on or what you shall eat. That was the Greek word suke, spelled P-S-U-C-H-E. Uh, and when he used the word that represents divine life, it was always zoe, Z-O-E, like he that believes on me has everlasting zoe. And here it says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, what is the law of sin and death? It was summed up by James in a very concise way, that when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the law of sin and death, an inescapable chain of events for every human being. When lust is conceived in the heart, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it comes to full maturity in a person's life, brings forth mental death, emotional death, spiritual death, ultimately physical death, and then eternal death. No one can escape that. But you and I, as partakers of the Holy Spirit, have received the spirit of life, the spirit of Zoe that cancels out the law of sin and death. Well, how can that be? I like to compare it to what the Wright brothers discovered when they finally got an airplane off the ground on Kitty Hawk many years ago. And look at how that industry has blossomed since. They learned that one law could cancel out another law. For instance, the law of velocity and the law of lift could cancel out laws like the law of gravity or the law of friction. And what should have held that plane to the ground instead had no power because they discovered another law that would elevate that plane up into the atmosphere. And in like manner, the law of sin and death should pull us all down into eternal destruction. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus lifts us up above this horrible chain of events and gives us the freedom that is available in Jesus. Now, if I'm a partaker of the Holy Spirit, I am a partaker of the Spirit of life. Next, the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Spirit of holiness in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it said he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's the only place in the entire Bible where you find the Holy Spirit referred to as the Spirit of holiness. 
why in this particular instance of Jesus being resurrected from the dead? I believe for this reason, because when he hung on the cross, it became sin for us. His soul was made an offering for sin. He absorbed the sin debt of the entire human race, and that's the only reason he could have died, because it was the ultimate consequence of sin, which he took upon himself for our sakes. But then in the tomb, three days later, the Holy Spirit in the role of the spirit of holiness came in and resurrected him back to a sinless state, resurrected him back to a completely uh, holy state. And because of that, death could not hold him. And he came out victoriously. Well, in like manner, if you and I are partakers of the Holy Spirit, then death cannot hold us because the spirit of holiness came into us when we offered our heart, just like Joseph offered his tomb for Jesus to be buried. We offered our hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell. And the Holy Spirit came into us in this role of the spirit of holiness and resurrected us from a death state spiritually. The Bible said, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, God has made alive or quickened us together with Christ. And so we have been created in righteousness and true holiness. This new spirit, this inner man, this hidden man of the heart, this born again part of us, the Bible says, is created in righteousness and true holiness. So holiness is not only something you attain to with your actions, but it's something you receive as an impartation and as an inheritance because you're a partaker of the Holy Spirit. You are a partaker of the spirit of holiness. Praise God. Romans 8.15 refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption. Let me read the scripture to you. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now the word Abba means dear father. It's a term of great endearment. And we would have no right to refer to God in that way in a fallen state because we were estranged from Christ. We were children of darkness. We were unsaved. We were separated from the Almighty. But then we were born again, thank God, and God only adopts into his family those who have received spiritual rebirth. And when the Holy Spirit came into our hearts in the form of the spirit of adoption, it was not the spirit of bondage, which is a reference to religion, the religion that uh, brought forth such bondage in their lives through the curse of the law was insufficient in meeting the human need. But now we've received the spirit of adoption. We haven't just received an, a bunch of rules, hundreds of commandments in order to somehow strive to attain to some kind of relationship with God through our own human effort. But now the Holy Spirit has come into us and adopted us into the family of God so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. We have this loving relationship with him now. That's absolutely amazing. He's my father. He's not just a distant God I'm separated from. He's a loving father I'm united with. And the Holy Spirit did that for me. And I'm a partaker of the Holy Spirit. You're a partaker of the Holy Spirit. And if so, I have partaken of the spirit of adoption by which I can cry, Abba, Father. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? Next, let's go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. In that verse, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of grace and supplication. Now, what is grace? Grace is unmerited love. It's also divinely imparted ability. It's the abundant generosity of God toward us. And in this particular passage of Scripture, it's talking about a time 
when all nations will be gathered together against Jerusalem to battle, when there will be an assault on Israel in the last days. And we can see the anti-Semitism building up in the world toward an ultimate day when that may be their attempt to cause, to force Israel to do the will of the new world order in order to recognize the Palestinians with a separate state or whatever the cause, whatever the motivation may be, all nations will gather together against Jerusalem to battle. It's going to build to a peak of impossibility. But that's one of the things God does. He waits until everything looks completely impossible and then he intervenes in the nick of time. And right when it looks like there's no hope, you find out there's endless hope in him because he said he would pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem in that day the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. Wow. If there is a demonstration of the grace of God to be found in Scripture, it's found in this verse because many Jewish people, of course, have accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, but many of them have not. And as a whole, over the past 2,000 years, the majority of Jews have rejected Jesus' claim to Messiahship. And yet, that's not going to phase him. Right at the critical moment when they need him the most, even if they've rejected him for 20 centuries, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him, let the curse be upon us and upon our children. And I don't blame the Jews for the death of Jesus because it was Gentile soldiers that put him on the cross. Both Jews and Gentiles are equally guilty. But still, as a nation, for almost 2,000 years, for the most part, they've rejected him. But right in their greatest time of desperate need, he will pour out unmerited love on them. And they will look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son. And of course, there'll be sweeping salvations in Israel, I believe, at that time. There will be multiplied thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions coming to the Lord as they see him for who he really is. And if the Lord Jesus Christ can pour out the spirit of grace on those who have rejected him for nearly two millennia, then I don't care what kind of a past record has been in your life. The spirit of grace and supplication can change everything for you. God can pour out unmerited love on you, and then he can give you the ability to make supplication because that's what grace does. Grace gives you the ability to effectively pray. Supplication means to make a petition of God in an acceptable way. If it's grace-filled, then it's received by the God of grace. And thank God, thank God, God will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication on anyone who is a partaker of the Holy Spirit. I claim that for myself today. I claim it for you, that the spirit of grace and supplication will fall on you and that you will see significant breakthroughs in your life, in your family's life, and in areas that you're concerned about. Now, the next name for the Holy Spirit is one very dear to me. It's found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. And I'll explain why it's dear to me in a little bit. But he is referred to as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Listen to what Paul prays. Therefore, I also, after that I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So much is contained in that passage. First of all, I want you to understand that you can claim this as a done deal in your life because that wasn't just Paul praying for the Ephesian church. That was the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that was the Holy Spirit writing those words through Paul. Holy men of God write as they are moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And so that's not just Paul praying for you. That's the Holy Spirit making intercession for you. Because, by the way, the scripture says when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will make intercession for us. And so he's interceding that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God will be poured out on our lives. Well, I receive that in Jesus' name. And you should say, I receive it in Jesus' name. That the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God will come to me that the eyes of my understanding might be enlightened. We need understanding in this dark era that we're a part of with such chaotic things happening in the world. We need God's guidance. We need God's insights into what we should do and how we should respond and what needs to happen so that revival and harvest can come. And the spirit of wisdom and revelation can do that. Wisdom from God. Wisdom is how to apply knowledge to your life in a practical way. And revelation, well, the word is apocalypsis. And that's the same word that refers to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Apocalypsis. And so it's not only, it's not only the coming of the Lord that will usher into this world the fullness of the presence of God. But when the spirit of revelation comes into your life, all kinds of wonderful treasures are imparted to you. And here he lists three, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you might know the hope of your calling and the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power toward those who believe. God gave me this scripture back around 1985 when I first began writing on the names and titles of the children of God. That's why it's so dear to me, because that was the theme scripture of the whole series of books I wrote called Our Glorious Inheritance, and we're in the process of republishing them. And, of course, that was the basis of my newest book on this theme, which is, Who Am I? The Dynamic Declarations of Who You Are in Christ. And so, this scripture is a living reality to me. And I pray that you will accept it as part of your inheritance as a child of God. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Actually, Paul was writing or repeating a scripture from Psalm 116, verse 10, where the psalmist said, I believed and therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. So he knew how to pull his way out of affliction by speaking words of faith, speaking words of confidence, speaking words of overcoming. I believed, and therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted, the psalmist said. Now, later on, Paul quotes that passage and says, we have the same spirit of faith. In other words, you and I have the same application of the Holy Spirit to our lives that David did the same application of the Holy Spirit to our lives that Moses did, that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did, that Daniel did, the same spirit of faith that made them speak against the negatives they faced in life and all the opposition and all the impossibilities, but they spoke words of faith and overcame miraculously. 
you and I have the same spirit of faith and we can overcome miraculously by the declaration that comes from our lips. And it's because we are partakers of the Holy Spirit. And one role he fills is the spirit of faith in our heart and in our lives. Praise God. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. On your part, he is glorified. The Holy Spirit in that passage is referred to as the spirit of glory. The spirit of glory. Now, in the Hebrew, the word for glory is kabod. And it means a heavy weight. It represented the reality, the heaviness of the presence of God that rested upon the Ark of the Covenant. That was the glory in between the cherubim, on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. But now you and I are the temple of God. And now we are the bearers of the Ark of the Covenant and the spirit of glory rests upon us. We're the new Holy of Holies, so to speak, because our regenerated spirit is where the glory dwells. Praise God. What does the word glory mean? has a number of meanings. Number one, it means the manifest presence of God. Number two, it means the perfection of his character. For instance, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's talking about the glory of his attributes, his perfect peace, perfect love, perfect joy, perfect humility, perfect righteousness, perfect holiness in every area, every characteristic, every attribute. He's the ultimate. He is the absolute. He is perfection itself. And so we've all fallen short of that glory. The glory of God is the perfection of his character. Number three, the glory of God is also his majesty, his highness, and his greatness. The heavens declare the glory of God. Well, that means his greatness, his majesty, his highness, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his magnitude. It's, it's just uh, it's boggling to the human mind to just imagine the greatness of the infinitude of God. No beginning and no end. That is the glory of God. His glory is also his dignity and his power. His glory is also his celestial radiance, his actual visible celestial radiance, because the Bible said he dwells in a light that no man can approach unto and no man has seen. And the spirit of glory rests upon us, especially when we're persecuted, according to 1 Peter 4.14. Think of that. All of these things have been imparted to us. You may quote to me a scripture I often hear misquoted. I hear people say, well, God will not share his glory with anyone. Well, I agree with that, but I don't agree with the interpretation that sometimes people give it. Because what they're doing is they're misquoting a passage that is referring to idolatry, the practice of worshiping idols. Isaiah 42 verse 8. God said, I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. He's talking about refusing to share his glory with false deities. He's not talking about refusing to share his glory with his people, because in his last great intercessory prayer, Jesus prayed, and he said, Father, the glory you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So he actually prayed that we would receive his glory. Yes, he does share it with those who surrender their lives to him, to those who become partakers of the Holy Spirit, 
this function of the Holy Spirit, this title of the Holy Spirit is manifested in our lives as well. The spirit of glory rests upon us. And so God's character is poured into us and ultimately we will share his glory in the infinite state because the Bible says we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. And so this glory increasingly will be manifested in our lives because the scripture says we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. It's only going to get better. Now, I've given you a great overview of different names that rest upon the Holy Spirit that indicate different aspects of your inheritance as partakers of the Holy Spirit. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Have a wonderful day.